T.I. is known for his creative talent, the, the brilliance on stage. He's known all around the world. Um, but they're trying to find Ambassador Young. But they don't necessarily understand there's a business mind behind that. And what they got to see, because I asked him just to design the panel himself, what they got to see on Wednesday was his brilliant business mind. And no, help you. <laughs> that's how you build the city right there. <laughs> With a do-it-yourself attitude. <laughs> <laughs> man needs a chair, he gets it. <laughs> Do it yourself, man. Yeah, there you Why go. Why don't you sit here, Ambassador Young? I, you, you. <laughs> no, I've been sitting in the back, and I tell you, I have been fascinated. This has been, I mean, I don't, I don't, I've never been in a situation like this last few days. And I would... J.D. Vance, hillbilly elegy, uh, relating this so that what we're talking about is not race, we're talking about life. Yeah. I mean, this has been America at its best. Mm. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And these are some of my favorite people, too. Yeah, so, I, so before Ambassador Young interrupts me, which will be in about 30 seconds, <laughs> I'll, just say, I, I'll just say that T.I., who I love increasingly like a brother, and he's a great father too. He had his children with him at the session on Wednesday, and I can tell you, he's raised them right. They're really up, 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 upstanding, young people, respectful. He's got them focused on education, and he's saying, yeah, exactly. He's saying, don't expect me to take care of you for the rest of your life. In fact, I need you to get educated so you can take care of me. Um, and, but he's raising them right and um, putting them in situations like this so they understand that business is not just, I mean, life is not about glitz and glamour. It's a, you know, go do that, go part. But the, but the dictionary, Tony Ressler taught me this, only in the dictionary does the word success come before the word work because it's alphabetical. I think and, Webster screwed that up. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I was just commending that I think T has, is a really a well-rounded person who understands business and it has fun too, but it's building something that has substance to it. He owns his masters, he owns his brands, he owns his museum, is created, which is in the black now. And so we're going to have a conversation today about building. Ambassador has built a city. Tony Resser has built everything. Uh, Tony Resser runs a company with $120 billion in assets. You've been to Neiman Marcus, he owns it. You've been, I mean, there's 150 stores that Candy Moore in there, like, yeah! Uh, uh, there's 150 stores that Tony quietly owns. He has, it, the Aries management is invested in thousands of uh, projects around the world. And, and then he, of course, owns the Hawks, and his brother and him are innovating this city within the city, which he will tell us about, hopefully, the Gulch, which is a great project, which will create 30,000 jobs for folks in Atlanta, 40% of which are going to be minority set-aside contracts uh, for people of color. <laughs> Dallas Tanner started with a, in real estate with a uh, trailer park, basically, and I think it was like two, initially, trailers as a business idea with nothing, and has grown that from a trailer park. Listen to me now. Dallas Tanner, 38 years old? 39 as of Monday. 39, happy birthday has grown that into a company with assets of $24 billion. And the company is now the largest startup in Blackstone's history. It's called Invitation Homes. Go on your phone and check out Invitation Homes. It's publicly traded. The founder of Invitation Homes flew in just for this. So we have the, the largest REIT in his space in the world um, and one of the top five in America uh, uh, in real estate, Dallas Tanner. We have one of the biggest builders of business in the world, Tony Ressler. We have one of the, build, the, the original builders in entertainment business, uh, TI. I built a nonprofit and, uh, and other things. And, and my hero here built the only international city in the South. So, really, this is about as we close this up, as we close this. And by the way, have you guys enjoyed this forum? You want us to do it again? 
Um, I think this is really about giving people the tools. Let's get out of the clouds. Giving people the tools, and Tony, some hard truths about what it takes to build something from an idea to something that is sustainable because, as Tony reminds me, I can give you charity, but, but, but you're going to be begging for the rest of your life. Let me help create some black capitalists who can take care of themselves and then take care of their community, too, on a sustainable basis. Let's hand out fishing poles to everybody in our community. So let's let the conversation begin. You're the elder statesman. I, I, um, I really have learned more this week than many weeks in my life. And if you think about what we had up here today, uh, is J.D. Vance, the hillbilly elegy? Yeah, brilliant. I mean, that, that is America's problem. Uh, not at all political, but he's writing about what Trump considers his base. But what he's doing with it is what the government should be trying to do. He's trying to develop jobs, uh, Twitter. I, I don't know about the square. And I don't know about all of this technology, but both of those guys ended up coming back almost to where Deepak Chopra was in terms of the spirituality. Mm. He may not know it, but one of the reasons I like his basketball coach is the guy has got, we, we've never talked religion, but he's got a, a kind of soul power that he just infuses into these young kids, and you got everything from the youngest kid in the league to uh, the oldest guy in the league, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, who's been all over the world, and, and they sit there hanging to become a team. Now, that's what sports and business and, and, and spirituality and life coming together here this week has made this a, a great success. And I'll shut up and thank you all for doing what you do and just keep on doing it. And the eighth. Thank you. The eighth you. and ninth choices. Eighth is, and tenth. Eighth and tenth choices is somebody else's number. You got your number one and your number two, and bring it on home to us. <laughs> the draft. Okay, all right. <laughs> Look, translation here. <laughs> um, so, Tony, let's, let's really start this off with you. Um, you told me in one of our many conversations, if, if America wants to have social justice today, we got to, we, thank God for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Thank God for C, Reverend C.T. Vivian, uh, for, for uh, Mrs. King. Credit Scott King. Thank God for Dorothy, Dr. Dorothy Height. Thank God for Ambassador Andrew Young. All the heroes and sheroes, John Lewis, et cetera, who put the foundation in place for basic human dignity and civil rights. But now we have to switch to what I call silver rights, a movement in the suites, not just the streets, a movement about class and poverty, not just race and the color line. Those require, it's a different movement that requires a different set of skills and a different maybe approach. And you said, you suggested approach that I thought was mind-blowingly powerful and simple about if we wanted to pursue social justice in a successful way in the 21st century, we need to focus on, I think you told me three things, but you'll correct me. What were those, Tony? I'm not exactly sure which three well, things. Well, no, just we speak from your gut then. Uh, yeah. what, what, if, you, if I have to ask you the question. I have always said, uh, and, and listen, uh, John and I have had a lot more for-profit discussions than not-for-profit discussions. Correct. Uh, and I say that proudly, not that not-for-profit discussions aren't relevant as well, but most people would rather be asked for money than asking for money. And the truth is, in this country, the ability to have access to quality education yep. and access to quality capital, yep. i.e. attractively priced capital, 
are the two keys to create real businesses. Yep. And uh, generally speaking, there are many parts of this country, many groups of folks in this country that haven't had access to either quality education or reasonably priced capital. Yep. And that's a, that's a problem. And, and people talk about it being a problem in some areas and don't want to acknowledge it in others. And, and the truth of the matter is uh, access to capital gives people the ability to buy and create assets that you would never think possible. And, and again, a case in point, I'm, uh, this is a, the, the idea of financial literacy is remarkable across this country. But the ability to create 100 plus million dollars of value and frankly 700 homes over the past two years with access to capital and using your brain is precisely what John Bryan did over the past two years with the Promise Homes Company. Yeah. Right? And at the end of the day, the ability to create value is just that. And how we create access to capital for all parts of our society is critically important. And, and I don't think it's impossible to achieve. And uh, yeah, we're trying, I, I have access to capital. It's a huge advantage. And everyone in this room should figure out or should be assisted in how to access capital. A and generally speaking, if we're going to build, which we are as an example, downtown Atlanta hasn't had meaningful development in the past 50 years. Metro Atlanta has had extraordinary development over the past 50 years. And the fact that Atlanta has the largest airport in the world, and Ambassador Young to your and some of your colleagues, the, the ability to build the largest airport in the world is an unbelievable asset and resource for Metro Atlanta. And the ability to develop what will be five or six billion dollars and 12 million square feet in 40 acres of underutilized parking lots and railroad tracks is going to be a massive transformation. And, and again, with access to capital. So he walked right past this magical story that he didn't really tell. So I'm going to, it's embarrassing. So I go to Tony's office because he's rich and I wanted some of his money. I like him too, but. <laughs> you know, by the way, by the way, there are no ugly billionaires ever. They're all handsome or pretty or whatever. So, you know, so Tony was handsome. I want to go. I want to go see Tony. Sexy. I want to go see Tony. And uh, so I go. I go to Tony's office. I fly to LA. I got my PowerPoint presentation. I got my. You know, I emailed him stuff. He ain't looked at none of it. So this is for Operation Hope. I'm trying to get him to donate some money to Operation Hope. I walk in, I'm looking for $100,000. Now I've flown all the way from uh, Atlanta to LA. He, he, he sees me, he you know, gives me you know, 30 minutes for me. And he's always been generous, by the way, to, he'll, he'll always give us something. So he says, look, you know, look John, I, I'll give you $50,000. Basically, will you get out of my office? <laughs> 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 I'll pay you to go. Uh, uh, he says, but, but what else you got up your sleeve? Like, you know, we, we can do this game, right? And I'll see you once a year, and I'll look at my watch, and, you know, but you're not being taken seriously. He didn't say this, I'm inferring this. It, but, but you're a smart guy. What else you, so this is the nonprofit side. He says, well, I got this business thing I'm doing. It has nothing to do with Operation Hope. I've been trying to prove Operation Hope's a model uh, for a long time, and I think I found a way to do it. And, and to have some private assets. I want to own some homes and I want to lease them. And uh, it'll give me my own net, you know, additional net worth and so on and so forth. So I've been out of my own business for 20 years doing Operation Hope and I was originally an entrepreneur. He says, well, you know, what are you looking to do? I said, well, I'm, I'm gonna probably put a you know, couple million dollars into this, this, this new business. He said, I'm in. I said, well, I didn't ask you for anything. I said, I know, but I'm in. I said, what are you in for? I, I don't know, what do you need? I said, well, I don't, I don't need anything. I mean, your, your partner, Tony, uh, Michael Argetti, is putting in you know, a million five, I'll match it. That took three minutes. Now I've been, I've been all over him like a cheap suit. I've been chasing him, emailing him, uh, texting him. I went to his house, um, went to a game I didn't understand. Uh, I, went, I, I don't know, but I, if I could, listen, we, we could get into, but the business agreement 
And the business idea, which was John's, was said that if I had a, a bunch of money and I could leverage that money and I could buy homes to rent attractively because of who I am, where I live, and what I can do, we can make some money. So uh, to, to shorten the story, we said if we come up with $25 million of equity and we could borrow $50 million of debt from a bank attractively, and you could buy homes and run them <clears throat> excuse me, effectively, two years or three years from now, that $25 million should turn into 50, using the leverage, buying the homes well, and running them effectively from a renter's perspective, and offering financial literacy to the tenant. So, and by the way, so doing well and doing good. So again, over the, literally over a two-year period, round numbers, I would say that that $25 million has doubled in value. Yeah. His tenants have become far more financially literate. He's built a real business, and it was from his idea, his sweat, and access to capital that was reasonably priced. Yeah. And, and, that so, and so, so the last part of this funny story, we're on, I'm, I'm driving from, I'm in New York, and he had offered originally, you know, I think it was three million. He said, well, John, this is a great idea. Why should we do three million when we can do 30 million? I said, he says, well, actually, why should we do 30 million when we can do 130 million? This is like a conversation on the phone. And so he says, okay, well, we'll do, you know, I'm gonna call my banker. He happens to be the largest client for this bank. He calls the banker, the banker then sees me. They then ask, give me access to the debt. He, he, he wires me the equity. And by the way, he would never say this. I am the majority owner of this company. He didn't, he didn't have to do it. He could have been onerous about it. He, his intention was to put me in the game. And the way this deal works is, by the way, if you, if you get your credit score to 700, we reduce your rent permanently by 10%. And all of the, 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 the plumbers, the landscapers, the roofers, all those are minority owned or local businesses in the neighborhood getting $25 an hour jobs. And if you rent long enough, you get to own the house that you are renting because you can buy it. It's doing well and doing good. One thing I, I would adjust, and the truth is, my intention was not first to put you in the game. My intention... <laughs> By the way, why, why bullshit each other here? <laughs> Intangible benefit. My intention, my intention was to have a good, solid investment opportunity with someone that could build a real business for themselves. And I thought you could do both. And by the way, most opportunities you're going to find that are attractive should be both. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Bottom line. Yeah, absolutely. Look, that's blunt force love. Get used to it. You want to be in business? This is not emotional. This is not personal. This is business. And, and no one wants to hear your sob story about rents due and, and oh, it, it, it's- Nobody cares. Boom. Nobody cares. Whatever problems or whatever sorrows or, or whatever afflictions you have, Somebody took those same sorrows and won with them. That's it. Well, that's what we heard with uh, the Twitter man just now. The Twitter man. <laughs> <laughs> the Twitter man. The Twitter man. Sounds Twitter like man. a new song. Jack Dorsey. Jack Dorsey, yeah. yeah I want to have yeah, that, that, uh, No, I'm sorry. I, I, I think the, the, the quickest way to kill a deal is to beat around the bush and tell your personal problem. That's right. That's the quickest way to kill a deal. And, and don't use 20 words when two will do. Right. No one has time to be listening to all this stuff you got to say. What is the business proposition? If there's an end to this story, can we please start there? And so that's what I mean. You really you cut to the chase. You know, look, is this, can we make money? Does this build wealth? Do you have a competency to do it? Do I trust you? And by the way, also, do I like you? Because nobody wants to do business with somebody they don't like. Nobody. Well, or, or somebody who doesn't have passion. Because I keep thinking about what Tony said around access to capital, but people are also looking for people that are passionate. Yeah. You gotta have work ethic, you gotta have the hustle. But I think one of the reasons I'm speaking freely, because Tony and I have talked a couple of times, we don't know each other all that well. But you know, one of the things that we knew about John 
and I think Tony and Mike knew about John or about the Promise Homes idea was the passion that was going to go behind it. And so you can make up for a lot of lack of book smarts, lack of experience with passion. I'm convinced. Certainly. You need mentors. You need access to capital. But if you don't love what you're doing or love the idea of what you're doing, switch. If you're not passionate about what you're doing, you're not going to put in the time, effort, and energy it takes to learn how to do what, you, what, what you're doing. And, and Tip, on that point, tell your story, because that really is your story. That's the gateway to everything about you. By the way, nice suit. Thank uh, you. The, your story coming up, you didn't... Come to my bespoke, my bespoke, my haberdashery. I'll get you fitted and suited, no problem. <laughs> okay. You, you, own, you own... All of you guys, you know, uh, Heidi Aki. Uh, and bring your credit card. Company. Absolutely. I mean, however, cash, whatever, you know. <laughs> Bullion, whatever you have. We'll take. Bitcoin? <laughs> yeah, well, no, we don't want to do no Bitcoin. Not right now, no. You and you me know. both. Yeah, we don't want to do that. But actually, that was under your, under your guidance. You know what I'm saying? I kind of exited out of, you know what I'm saying, my interest. I never, ever had any, you know, to begin with. But I was interested. I was researching and considering. And you said, Tip, get out of there. Get out of there right now. <laughs> it's not an investment, it's speculation. Right. The, 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 the blockchain is really solid technology, but the bit Bitcoin is just, it's just investor speculation right. at the moment. It may evolve over time, and at the moment, it's just speculation. But, but, don't, don't, don't bet your rent money. But what I, but what I was saying is, though, uh, so, so for me, I've always had interest in doing a lot of things, especially on an entrepreneurial level. In fourth grade, I started selling candy. I started selling candy because I, my, my father lived in New York in Upper Manhattan. He was very, very well off. My mother was on Section 8, and my grandmother lived on, uh, on Bankhead on the west side. So I'd go from the summer where we had all the, the, the snacks and food and cable, every channel, soda stacked to the ceiling, and, and, and he'd give me, he'd take me school shopping, give me three, four hundred dollars, I'd go back to Atlanta back to poverty. So by the time I was about nine or 10 years old, before I got on that plane, I, well, on my ride, on, on, on the plane ride home, I started thinking, how can I stretch these $300 from now until Christmas when I see my dad again? So I took $100, my, my grandmom would take me to Sam's Warehouse, that's Costco, the old school Costco for young people. And, you know, we buy Snickers and Now and Laters and Penny Oh, candy. Now and Laters. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so I, and my goal was to make $20 a day. Okay, so I package uh, uh, $20 worth of candy a day, and I make $20 a day, and I stretch that $300 until I saw them again. And by sixth grade, I had people selling candy for me on the seventh grade hall, the eighth grade hall. And... <laughs> And, and, and that is how I began my entrepreneurial efforts. Uh, and, but the thing is, I've never had access to any capital other than my own, which is how John and I became acquainted last year. Everything I've done, I've done out of my own pocket. I don't even know how to ask anybody for money because all of the information and the yellow tape that they make me jump through, it makes me feel like, you know what, I'll just go and get the money myself. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And uh, you've done that, by the way. You, I have. He's bought millions of dollars worth of real estate on the west side, cash. He's, uh, which I want to talk to you about. Uh, he's bought, <laughs> a little leverage is important. He's bought, he's, he paid for his trap music, music museum. museum. Yes. Cash, and it's in the black, right? It is. And now you're talking about taking it on the tour. On a, on a yeah, tour. We, and we also did what we call the Tiny House, the Tiny uh, Trap, the Tiny Trap Music Museum. That we, it's a traveling small version of the concept. Uh, we were we were just in Myrtle Beach for for their weekend. We're going to BET. We're taking the traveling to the BET experience, uh, and and we're finding ways to make it mobile now. But if you don't believe it, well, I found that if you don't believe enough in your own idea to put your own skin in the game, then nobody else should. That's right. So I, I try to lead. I lead with my own. Putting your own money in the game and having skin in the game, which I completely agree with, actually makes lenders and other investors Agreed. more comfortable. More comfortable. Mm. So not everyone has the capital you have to put to work. So the ability to commit yourself and your own capital will help you raise third-party capital 
to do even bigger things. And, and to me, it's, it's not about whether you use your own or other folks. It's about whether you have passion for what you want to do. It's about whether you're willing to commit your time and money and having access to capital. They're not either or. Pull up a little closer, Tony. Three, we can They're not either or. Uh -huh. And to me, when you do all three, that's when small millions get to many more millions, which Excellent. I'm sure is the direction you're going in. Absolutely. That is my definite intention. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, so Dallas, what, is your, what was your ingredient? Very quickly, what was your story coming up, up from nothing? And what is your ingredient for the audience for success? So I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, Arizona and our company's based in Dallas, Texas. Um, you want to tell the story? Of we have 12 and a half thousand homes here in Atlanta. It's part of our company. Atlanta is a really important city to our business. And I was always passionate growing up. I was watching my friends. I was watching. The dads that could be at practice were always in real estate. I don't know why, mm. but they were always in real estate. Um, my family's background is in construction, so my dad worked long hours. And I thought, I got to get into real estate. And so when I was in school, I was always geared towards learning a little bit more around finance. That goes to the passion comment. You know, you start to kind of dive into things that you, you find curi you know, intellectually curious or, or that you f they speak to you to some degree, right? We've all had those moments. Um, and for me, it was like this concept of the game of Monopoly, as funny as it sounds. It was like if you're patient enough, you go around the board enough times, you start collecting, right? You'd be smart about the amount of leverage you use. And I found a couple of partners that Sorry, thought can about, you explain the audience leverage? Sure. So, you know, the nice thing about real estate, uh, to uh, TI's point, is you don't have to use all your own money. You can borrow if you put yourself in a position to do so. And so you can borrow intelligently. I'm sure Tony's done this the same way. But you know, over time and distance, you get smarter, and your access to capital increases, and your terms get a little friendlier sometimes, it, depending friendlier. on where you are in the cycle and, and mm -hmm. what the opportunity is. But for us, we just we, we got passionate around housing, workforce housing specifically. Yeah. You know, our average rent in our first project we ever did, the average person was paying $425 a month. We, I mean, we were not buying Boardwalk or Park Place. Right? We were Atlantic Avenue or whatever the first one is. Mm. But we found that in that workforce piece, we just got passion around. We started improving communities, and that, that made us hungry, made us want to go out and find other opportunities, other markets. Then, you know, we went through this nasty housing crisis in 2007 and 2008, mm. and we had a little bit of a track record. So this goes to the part about the hustle or just having a little bit of some history. And, 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 and look, we got really lucky with timing. And I think all of us would tell you there's an element of luck involved yep. in any of our stories. Absolutely. But the only reason you can take advantage of that luck is by putting yourself in that position. That's right. And so for us, which was a very unlucky time for the country, we, we always joke, in a room full of midgets, we were the tallest midget. We were. <laughs> there wasn't anyone that had 1,000 homes in one market. Right. So we had 1,000 homes in Phoenix, and we were running them at 96%, and then the Blackstones and the Aries of the world and the Apollos and... All the big, you know, private equity guys were saying, hey, can you replicate this? Because somebody saw our passion. We had a little bit of a track record. Right. They, wanted, they saw your success. They run with the story. It's, it, this is a really important point. Listen to me now. They saw your success, and they wanted a piece of it. Nobody wants your risk. Right. Nobody wants your problems. Nobody wants your complaints. Nobody wants your headaches. No one's trying to solve your, solve your social problems. Nobody's going to invest in your business because it's, it feels good. In fact, it's just the opposite. But we're doing something, I, I don't, Dallas is, you went from having 1,000 homes in Phoenix that were well run to 90,000 homes across the country today and being by far the largest on, in the country, literally utilizing, and I'm saying this in a positive, leveraging other people's Absolutely. money yeah. to get to that 90,000 home. Yeah. Leveraging other people's money to get to those 90,000 homes. That, that's not a bad thing. No. And, that's and, a good thing. And, and I just add, Absolutely. to your point about timing and just being in the right place at the right time, we put ourselves in those positions by hard work. But that's seven years. We did that in seven years. Who's to say what we don't do over the next 14 years? So let's be practical business. here now, right now. Let's, what can everybody do right now? So think about some place, uh, uh, I don't know, Nashville, Tennessee, or, or let's just- Birmingham. Okay, Birmingham. So 
you want to go, I'm just going to be real simple. You want to go to an urban community, preferably a qualified opportunity zone. Absolutely. And go to an urban community. You want to be able to see downtown from the place I'm talking about. Find a home that's toe up from the flow up. The worst home on the best block where you can see the buildings downtown, okay? You want to be within rock throw, you know, as the crow flies, you want to be within shooting distance of jobs downtown. You can buy that little raggedy house for $30,000, $15,000. Sometimes out, less. Sometimes less. Buy it, rehab it for $30,000, maybe. If, if. If, right, depending on the condition of the house. Okay, so, you can all do this, do this several ways. Whoever in your crew, your family has good credit. It's always one in every family now. <laughs> that you ain't got two yet. <laughs> hasn't towed up the credit yet. And that, that person goes to the bank to try to get a rehab loan for this property. They're putting their credit up, which means everybody's got to participate. Now, write this down. Do not do a, the, 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 the hookup. Do an LLC, a limited liability corporation, put it all on paper so there's no miscommunication if you have partners. You don't want to get into he said, she said, and oh, I thought this, because when things go wrong, everybody thinks something different. So everybody write it down, put some money in the pot, even if you just have $500, put something in, and go to the, best, the lead person, whoever's the lead person using their credit probably gets more out of the deal than everybody else. That's fine. Go to the bank, get the rehab loan. Now, you may have to work weekends, going to Home Depot or Lowe's, wherever. You may have to roll up your sleeves and go and fix that house up on weekends every weekend for six months. That's okay. And the first one is always the worst one. Right. We've both done it. Yes. The first one is always the most difficult. Uh, I... I myself, I, 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 I told John, John, because he, he, he asked me, he said, Tip, you're doing all of this stuff and you got all this stuff going on. Why don't you get you, I want you to get you some residential property. I want you to get you some rental properties that you can put families in. And I say, John, that is boring. I did. I, I said, you want boring. I did that, I did that from 2000 to 2008 and that's just boring. And I'm gonna tell you a little story how I got into it. So my uncle, he was away uh, in prison and he came. <laughs> oh, on vacation. At, or, or college. Um, <laughs> 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 so, so he comes home at the very year when I got my first recording contract with LaFace. I got a signing bonus. It was about $40,000, $50,000. And so I think it may have been the week that I got my check. And he said, Tip, give me $20,000. I said, huh? <laughs> That's half. You just got here. <laughs> what do you mean? He said, no, listen, you're not going to do nothing but run through this money anyway. Just give me $20,000. So I'm like, man, okay, cool. I gave him $20,000, ran through the rest as expected. Two, three months later, uh, we riding through my grandmother's neighborhood where I used to in engage in some unmentionable activities. <laughs> Let's just call me a refugee from the Iran-Contra scandal. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so we, we ride past this house that I used to engage in my activities out of, and I recognized the house, but it looked you much were a different. a pharmaceutical representative. Yes, at one time I was an independent pharmaceutical Rep. contractor, yes. <laughs> so one of my offices in that neighborhood, <laughs> He rode me by there and he pointed at it, right? And he says, you see that? I said, damn, that's Jimmy Jam House. That looks a lot different. And he says, nah, that's not Jimmy Jam House. I see, he said, that's what we did. I said, what do you mean? He said, I bought it from Jimmy Jam. I fixed it up myself, but from what I learned in prison, and I, we put a family in there. Mm. I said, what? <laughs> and, and, and he said, now, now, I could give you your $20,000 back. And as I reached for it, he said, or 
<laughs> we can go and buy two more houses around the corner. I said, all right, cool. So from 2000 to 2007 or eight, we did like 75, 80 houses wow. over in the West Side area. Wow. Um, and it made me feel really good to, to know that that's at that moment when he showed me the house, that's when I realized how much I contributed to the destruction in my community. And I never felt anything about it until then. Mm. And the thing that really made me feel another way is in 12 months, when I rolled past the same house and saw it was a crack house again, mm. I said, man, we got to do a lot more if we're going to cover any ground. And when that unfortunate moment hit in 2007, 2008, uh, that's when we, were, we had bought a lot of land. We were about to build a subdivision. We had construction loans. And I said, I say, well, you know, I'm tired of building these houses. Let's build a house that people like me can stay in. Uh -oh. So we went to uh, down South Fulton, uh -oh. uh, right next to Tyler Perry's first house. We bought a bunch of land, and we were about to do a subdivision. And then the loans fell from under our feet. And I had... 800,000 of my money tied up into it. And I say, hey, Quint, listen, I got a day job. I don't have to take this. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> and so from that moment on, that's when I said, you know, if I'm going to do something, I want to do commercial development. And now I'm fortunate enough to have a 200-unit mixed-use development being built right on Donnelly Hollywell. We should break ground early next year. But that's what I mean by it was boring yeah, to yeah. me. Yeah, so, you know, and by the way, that transition to mini mansions is, you, I don't want you doing that. Uh, <laughs> because I, I got bored. Yeah, yeah. You, by the way, you want your financial planner to be boring. You want your accountant to be boring. You want your banker to be boring. Whoever's handling your money, you want to, them to put you to sleep. <laughs> well, and in residential, people are guaranteeing the loans. In commercial, you're not guaranteeing the loans. So anytime you guarantee a loan, this is all about financial literacy, yep. how you borrow money. Yep. It seems a little strange that rich people pay a lot less money for their money than poor people. That's right. Think yes. about that. Oh, yeah. Those who make the least pay the most. Right. When I, when I, when, when I sign a loan application for a single-family home, I'm signing personally. It's a personal guarantee. Bunch of documents. Personal guarantee. Well, when I go and sign... $25 million deal for the Promise Homes Company is non-recourse. Yeah. I, I'm not personally guaranteed. It's the assets of the corporation. It's a commercial credit, and the rates are incredible. It is unbelievable when you're able to get this. When you finally get, when the light comes on, it's actually easier to do a big, a big deal it is. than it is to do a small one. But, you, but the only way you can get to the big deal is by doing the small one. So again, on that step, we got to wrap this up. I want you to go... Think about buying that home, get, get with your posse, write, the, write it down, LLC, no emotions, buy it, rehab it, and hold it, and rent it. Buy it, rehab it, rent it out at an affordable rate. You're creating affordable housing. You, you, you're going to be able to be proud of what you're seeing. It's, and this is how you make money. You make money when you sleep. Whether it's stocks, bonds. Uh, uh, rental real estate, commercial real estate. Passive income. Passive income. You make money yeah. when you're asleep. So when you're sleeping, if their rent money is coming in, that's what I'm talking about. And you take that one house that now, that's now worth $100,000, you've got, got $50,000 into it. Now you have $50,000 worth of equity. equity. Now you've got a net worth. Now you use that equity to then buy the next house. You do two or three of those, and now you have found you can leverage you can leverage that that 50,000 and get 100,000 and Boom. Buy even more. Can I um, yeah. Can I explain my silence? <laughs> Please do. I've never seen, I've never and, ever and, seen you silent. I well, did not know no, you had you, an explanation. You all are talk <laughs> yeah, cuz you all are talking about money. And Tom Bradley told me you can bring the Olympics but you and nobody in your family can make any money. Because you were the mayor. Yeah. And that in order to see to it that the percentages are right, you can't be personally involved. 
And I'm saying this because I'm proud of all that's going on. But I'm also thinking that Maynard Jackson gave his life mm. to make this happen, that Shirley Franklin, Bill Campbell went yes. to jail trying to help other people. Bill didn't do anything dishonest. I want you to know that. Right, he was here. They, he was here. They, they're giving hell to, to um, Kasim. Yeah. Uh, but we wouldn't have the dome and we wouldn't be, you and Kasim started talking about the, Absolutely. the gulch. So the movie industry that brought all this here, Kasim was a, an attorney for the film industry and help make all of this happen. And I'm, I'm saying that to say that, um, well, I'm saying that as an excuse for being poor and not being <laughs> in the class of these gentlemen. But I'm also, I'm also saying that everybody I've heard here has had conversations about family, about church. Deepak Chopra talked about the spirituality of all of our existence. And so this isn't a crass, crude, uh, greedy, materialistic discussion. This is free enterprise at its best. Mm. This is democracy that is also working for the least of these God's children and giving all of these folk who, none of y'all started out particularly rich. You didn't have a trust fund. At no. all. So, yeah, nope. And, but at all. it's Zero. Atlanta keeping this environment this Bro. way. Uh, and when John is, people have come to me with all kinds of money making opportunities. And I say, no, somebody has, to, Dr. King said, we have to stay out of the game in order to make sure that the game is fair. Mm. And so to, I thank you, and I thank all of you for taking advantages of the opportunities that we've created here in this city, and to say that spread those opportunities throughout the planet. One thing we haven't talked enough about is if there is a future for the African continent, it's going to come out of the experiences that we've had in African-American free enterprise. Right on. And so it was a new world for me to have uh, the Twitter man <laughs> you know, talking about, you know, um, I, I don't even know the terms what kind of mo fancy money this is you're all talking about? It's, it's digital currency. Digital Square, currency. Square, cash. But the, but the thing is that that's why the world is broken. Because the, the Bretton Woods Agreement that tied everybody's country together, com com money together, and all of the countries were working together in 1944 after the Second World War, was broken in 1974 while everybody was impeaching Nixon. And so in terms of all that's going on politically, don't forget that all this is going on economically under the, uh, under the radar. Mm. But perhaps this is where the realities are. And I want to close with a, a prayer of thanks to all of you. And that is that uh, we're talking about money, but money is simply the vehicle through which the hungry will be fed, the naked will be clothed, the sick will be healed, and those who are oppressed uh, will know the freedom and liberation and opportunities uh, that the Creator has made available to all of his children. Thank God for all of our blessings and keep on keeping on to them to whom much has been given, of them will much be required. Bless you and amen.